So we're going to start talking about the, the skeleton here. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll scatter these discussions over a fairly long period of time. Um, and just to remind you again, since I just started the recording, um, I should be able to draw on you. Okay, so um, our axis consists of the skull, and then we had the thoracic cage, and you don't need to draw this. We had the sternum here, and that's the thoracic cage, and then the vertebral column, and then we had the pectoral girdle, and we said a girdle is a circle of bone, okay? A girdle is a circle. Uh, if something engirdles something, it, it encircles it. And so a girdle is a circle, uh, and as far as the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle go, these are circles of bone. And attached to these circles of bone, we have limbs, right? And so this is how we divided up our skeletal system. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is the pectoral girdle. And I took this picture from above, okay? This is a, just a skeleton. It's, it's a, uh, like one of those there. Uh, but I, I laid the skeleton on the ground, and I took the picture as if I was looking down into the thoracic cage from the skull. And the reason I did that is because I want you to actually see this circle of bone here. So if I... Let me see if I can change colors here. Probably not. So I can draw kind of a circle here. And I see that this is an incomplete circle. Okay. The only place that this circle of bone is attached to the axis is right at the sternum here. So I've got the sternum here and I've got the clavicle attaching to it. And nowhere else am I actually attaching to bone. The scapulae look like they're attached to the rib cage, but they're actually not. They're doing the, they have to put little screws in there to, to make it so that it, it holds to the rib cage. But it's only attached to the rib cage through muscle. There's no actual bony contact there between the, the scapula and the rib cage. And so I, I want you to be able to see this circle. Okay, there's a circle of bone here, and we can now turn our attention to the appendicular skeleton. Remember, this is divided into the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle, and the limbs. So we've already said that. Okay. And I'll put these into uh, the anatomy and physiology canvas. Um, this is currently in the medical forensics one. Again, keep in mind the vision of the pectoral girl is roughly forming a circle of bone. And again, here's that circle, right? Here's the circle here. Um, and it articulates. What's it mean to articulate? What do we usually mean when we say articulate? I'm articulating something to you. Like the form? What's that? Like the form, like when I say I'm trying to articulate Yeah, you're trying to articulate, you're trying to tell me something about something, right? You're trying to explain it, okay? When we talk about articulation with bone, it's how does this bone communicate with another bone, okay? Physically, how does it communicate with another bone? It articulates... And what do we call these articulations? Uh, what do I call it where one bone meets another bone? It's a joint, right? Okay, so I've got a joint here. And so these bones articulate with each other. That's right. Several of you have had this already. Uh, uh, so you can do this lecture instead of me. Uh, so we articulate here. We communicate with each other through a joint. Okay. Through a joint, 
Okay, so uh, the circle of bone articulates with the sternum anteriorly. Remember, this is anterior right here, right? This is anterior, this is posterior. So the circle of bone articulates with the sternum anteriorly, okay? And it articulates with the chest wall and vertebral column posteriorly through muscles which help control movement of the pelvic gir or pectoral girdle, okay? So this provides us a site of attachment and support for the bones of the upper limb, okay? So the bones of the upper limb are attached to this circle here, right? I've, I've got this attachment to the outer part of the circle here where the limbs hang off of it, okay? So there's a site of attachment for the limbs, okay? And it's also attached to the axial skeleton loosely enough that the girdle is fairly mobile. And I want you to really think about this. Um, I'm sure you've seen lampshades before, right? You've seen lampshades, and there's usually a little screw on top of the lampshade that if you unscrew it, the lampshade becomes wobbly, right? And if I think about it, that's how the motion of my pectoral girdle is. It's very wobbly. This circle of bone sits here. This circle of bone sits here, and its only attachment to the axis is right there. So it can wobble all over the place. Okay? So the pectoral girdle, its structural features are such that it is very range of motion oriented. I can do this with my arm, right? But I can't do that with my leg, can I? If I tried to do that with my leg, I'd rip my leg off of my body, right? If I tried to go in motions like this. But we can do all kinds of things with this girdle, this pectoral girdle, because of its very loose attachment to the axis. The function of that is that it's got a large range of motion. Now, what do you expect if I have something that has a large range of motion in terms of stability? It's not going to be very stable, is it? And in fact, it's very easy to dislocate your shoulder. Okay, if you hit your shoulder right, it's very easy to dislocate it. And so the stability of that upper girdle is not all that great. Okay? And so if we have lots of range of motion, we sacrifice stability. And we'll find out that when we compare that with the pelvic girdle, the pelvic girdle is built for a great deal of stability rather than range of motion. I don't have anywhere near the range of motion in my pelvic girdle, but I have a great deal of stability there. Okay, hey Marshall, what's the First blank in the paragraph. Sternum. Sternum. Okay. Oh, that's not gonna. Oh, I wonder if that'll actually play. Seriously.
Just to show you a stupid lampshade. See how wobbly the, the lampshade is when you unscrew the top of there? That's what I'm talking about. And that's exactly like how your, your pectoral girdle works. Okay? So I just wanted you to see that. And now I have to go back to this. They kept my drawings on there too. Okay, so anyway, so if you wobble your shoulders up and down and you picture the motion of the pectoral girdle as similar to that loosened lampshade, again, recognize that this allows, that what this allows is the fact that the whole girdle is only attached, that what allows this is that the only the whole, the whole girdle is attached at a single point. Um, Again, this extended range of motion comes at the expense of stability. It's not uncommon for shoulder separations. And you're already aware that the pectoral girdle is formed from just two bones. What are the two bones that form the pectoral girdle? The clavicle and the scapula. Clavicle and the scapula, right? And the scapula. Okay, so clavicle is a thin, slightly S-shaped bone that extends from the manubrium. You don't need to know this word yet related to the sternum. Uh, that comes later. But the sternum medially, okay, remember medial means toward the midline, to articulate with the lateralmost portion of the scapula laterally. Okay, so here's that. Here's the sternum right here. This part of the sternum is called the manubrium. This is the medial articulation towards the midline, right? And here I've got the clavicle meeting with the, the sternum here. And then I've got the scapula over here. This is the lateral articulation. And what we're going to do is name these joints based on the names of the bones that they're joining. So if I'm joining the sternum and the clavicle, I'm going to call that the sternoclavicular joint. Okay. And I've got the part of the scapula that meets at the other end. The part of the scapula that meets it at the other end is called the acromion. So this is going to be called the acromioclavicular joint. Okay, the acromioclavicular joint or the AC joint as far as the shoulder is concerned. And then I've got the humerus attaching into the shoulder joint there. Okay. So as the region of articulation with the scapula is also the area where the humerus attaches, the clavicle acts as a brace to stabilize the positioning of the shoulder. So this structure right here, and it even kind of looks like a brace for this structure right here, doesn't it? Okay, if I didn't have this brace, if I went to push on something, my shoulder would give away like that. Okay, so if I push on this, I tighten this area with muscles, and that stabilizes that whole area there so that I can push on this with force. I don't want to break it, but if I pushed on this, I, if, if I didn't have that, again, my shoulder would kind of give away if I didn't have that brace there to stabilize things. So one of the functions of the clavicle is to act as a brace. Okay, so I can use, I can do that with, with power rather than it giving away. So the clavicle acts as a brace to stabilize the shoulder so it doesn't give away and lose power during arm motions. Okay, the scapula also moves up and down against the posterior chest wall as the shoulders are shrugged. Okay, so I can look at this and I can say, I can move up and down. So not only does it act as a brace 
if I stabilize it in this way, it also acts as a hinge at that point there. So I've got a hinge that I can move up and down with as well. Clavicle also anchor, anchors several muscles that are important of the motion of the arm, as well as several muscles that participate in head and neck motion. So I can see that the um, clavicle uh, is going to anchor the pectoralis muscle here in front. It's going to act as part of an anchor for the deltoid muscle as well. And then if I look at the um, other part of this, I've also got some muscles that will come down from the neck and attach to the clavicle and uh, allow me to um, shrug my shoulders as well. But there are a lot of groups of muscles that this, this bone anchors. Okay, so we're going to say that the clavicle articulates at the sternum. What do we call that joint where it articulates with the sternum? It's the sternoclavicular joint. Sternoclavicular joint. At the superior most part of the lateral edge of the manubrium. Yes, that says sternoclavicular. Sorry about the handwriting here. And this is immediately superior to the point of the attachment of the first rib. So if I go back to this, notice here's the clavicle and there's its attachment with the sternum and it's right above the first rib. Okay, so I, in fact, it covers the first rib to the degree that I can't feel my first rib. If I'm a physician and I'm trying to count ribs so that I know where to place a chest tube, if I'm trying to count ribs, I have to start with the second rib because that's the first rib that I can feel. So if I start with the first rib that I can feel and I count down so I can find the, so there's the second, third, fourth, so I can find the space between the fourth and the fifth ribs right there, the intercostal space, so that I can stick a chest tube in that. Um, that's uh, how I would, would go about doing that. I can't feel that first rib there. The first rib that you can feel is your second rib. Okay, so the clavicle articulates laterally with the acromion process. Acromion process. The process of bone that arches over the superior border of the clavicle. Again, that's it right there. You can see this, the, the um, scapula and notice how this this chunk of bone arches up over the shoulder there. So this chunk of bone arches up over the shoulder and you can see that here as well. So here's the scapula right here and here's the acromion. This is the acromion process and any chunk of bone that sticks up above the surface of the main bone might be called a process. So this is the acromion process and it attaches to the clavicle right there. Okay. So that's going to be the acromioclavicular joint. We've already said that this forms the acromioclavicular joint. I don't think we have those diagrams. You don't? No, we don't have the last thing we have is this joint here to the knee and then it goes into the scapula. Okay. That's distressing. Everything else was correct though, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, so in your notes then, sorry about that. Just at the top of the page on the next page, just write a chromium process articulates with clavicle and chromium. So just write. Let me add notes now. Chromium process articulated with what? With clavicle. Okay. I do have colors. So what does that mean by articulation? Okay, so the word articulation means to communicate with. And so this is how the bone, one bone communicates with another bone. Okay, so a chromium process articulates with clavicle. And then just put a chromio clavicular joint. Okay, so go ahead and write that in. A chromium process articulates with clavicle, a chromio clavicular joint. And you can see that in the diagram on the next page. We'll label these here just a little bit. Okay. Then you're aware you can see it. In fact, uh, I think the first thing you might think of when you see a scapula as well, this looks like a triangle. Um, the scapula or the shoulder blade is a large triangular shaped bone that has many prominent irregular surface markings. And one of the things that you should note about these irregularities, and this is not the same diagram you have in your notes, but look how irregular this whole thing is. Anytime you have an irregularity uh, in the surface of a bone, it's almost certainly for a muscle attachment, okay? Um, on the back side or the posterior side of the, the surface of the scapula, you have this large irregularity called the spine of the scapula. And it's almost as if you can grab onto that and move the scapula any direction you want to. And in fact, that's what the muscles of your back do. They grab onto the spine of the scapula and you can move the scapula in any direction you want to. Okay. So. The scapula, large triangular shaped bone, many prominent irregular surface markings, muscle attachments. Uh, the bone is held in place loosely and floats over the lateral portion of the upper back. And um, I'm sure you've all seen those cameras that sort of like float out over the surface of a basketball court. You know, you've got a camera sitting up here and it's got a wire coming out this way and a wire coming out this way and a wire coming out this way and one coming out this way. And if I pull on this wire and this wire, it moves it diagonally. If I move it, if I pull with certain tensions on other directions, I can move that pretty much any place I want to. Okay? And this is basically what the scapula does or has. I've got muscles that attach up here, I've got muscles that attach underneath of it, I've got muscles that attach to the side of it, and these muscles pull the scapula, it kind of floats like that camera does uh, over the surface of your back. Or I could clamp it down to your back 
so that it can be very stable. Okay, so motions of the pectoral girdle basically occur as a result of the differences in the states of contraction of all of the various muscles attached to the scapula. Okay, so I've got three borders and three angles of the scapula that I need to be need you to be aware of. So most of these bones, we're going to actually learn the names of all of these irregular features as well and the different parts of these bones. Okay, so I've got three borders and three angles. And you've got pictures of the scapula as well, and we'll label these again in here in a second. Um, so the first thing that I've said here is that we've got a border that's associated with the shoulder joint. So if I look at my, my scapula here, this is the anterior surface of the scapula, and the shoulder joint is right here, okay? Uh, right here at this point, you can kind of envision the head of the femur fitting into that right there, okay? So the head of the femur is going to rotate around inside that little socket or that little pouch there. And so the side of the scapula that's associated with the shoulder joint is the lateral border. Okay, so that's what's going to go in that first blank there, lateral border. Okay. And then the border that's relatively featureless is on the opposite side of that. That's going to be the medial border toward the midline, right? Medial toward the midline. Okay, and then obviously the only border left is going to be the superior border. Which is irregular and contains this little notch here. Okay, so this is kind of an irregular border and it contains this little notch here. And anytime you see a notch in a bone, that's generally going to be a passageway for a nerve to go through there so that it doesn't um, get cut in half every time the scapula moves. So this a little nerve and some blood vessels are going to run through there and that way it won't put tension. If it ran over the superior surface over here, um, every time you shrugged your shoulders it would cause tension on that nerve and on those blood vessels. So these little passageways are, are going to be uh, through here. And the word for above is supra, or a prefix for above, not only superior, it kind of sounds like superior, doesn't it? So this is supra scapular notch. The supra scapular notch is going to be at the superior border of this, a passageway for nerves that innervates two of the muscles that move the scapula. Okay, so I've got the lateral border, the medial border, and the superior border of the scapula. Okay, the angle at the base of the scapula formed by the lateral and medial borders is going to be called the inferior angle. It's the angle at the inferior part of the scapula. So all of these terms make sense if we remember our directional terms. Inferior angle. Okay. This is the angle formed uh, the angle formed by the superior and medial borders? It's going to be the superior angle. Okay, and then the prominence on the bone of the lateral border, just inferior to the shoulder joint, right here, is the lateral angle.
Okay. So three angles and three borders. Come on. Now the posterior surface, so one of the things that you'll need to be able to do is which surface is posterior and which is anterior. And so the posterior surface is the surface that has this huge chunk of bone sitting up above it. So like I can almost grab it and move it in any direction I want to, which again the muscles do. And this large irregularity here is called the spine of the scapula. Okay, and I have to say the spine of the scapula to distinguish it from the spine. Right, I don't want to confuse it with the actual spine. So this is the spine of the scapula. And this is a, a site of attachment for several muscles. And then the lateral end of the spine of the scapula is what becomes the acromion process. So this large chunk of bone, as it travels laterally and arches over the shoulder joint, is going to become the acromion process. That's not what I want there, though, is it? That doesn't make sense. So the lateral end enlarges into a process of bone arching over the shallow. So here, it's going to be the glenoid cavity, right? That's what I want in that next one. You just have that written. Oh, did I? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, which forms the cup of the shoulder, and that's, again, called the acromion process. Well, it doesn't like me to write the chrome. I have to go slower. Chromium process. This process articulates anteriorly with the clavicle forming, again, the, the chromio. Is this in your notes? Yeah. Okay. The chromio clavicular joint. Okay. Now, if I know that this part of the scapula is called the glenoid cavity, and I know that the humerus is what it articulates with to form the shoulder joint, what would I probably actually call the shoulder joint? Not the shoulder joint, but if I combine this with humerus, what might I say? Yeah, I might say gleno humeral, right? It's getting harder and harder for me to write there. So gleno humeral joint. So I'll ask you to call this the glenohumeral joint, not the shoulder joint. Are we running out of time? No, we still got time. From the anterior surface, you can view the acromion process, uh, and we can better visualize the acromioclavicular joint, just medial to the acromion and anterior to the shoulder joint is a second large process that points laterally right there, and that's going to be the coracoid process. Okay, that's going to be the coracoid process. Okay. 
and then just superior to the lateral angle and inferior to the acromion is a shallow cup-shaped cavity in the lateral border of the scapula called the glenoid cavity. Letting me write it all here. Okay, it's not letting me write on this. The glenoid cavity is what that's called. Notice how the cavity is bracketed by the acromion in the coracoid process, and that provides muscle attachments for muscles that move the arm. Ligaments and muscle attaching to the structure surrounding the cavity hold the head of the humerus in place. So make sure you get glenoid cavity there for that. Let's and then just to show you diagrams go. Okay, so these things right here are ligaments that hold the humerus to the, and you don't need to know about these ligaments, but notice I've got these pieces of tissue here that are holding, they're like really, really tight rubber bands, um, and they're holding the head of the humerus into that socket there, and then around that, I have muscles. Oops, where did those go? I thought I had some pictures of the muscle. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, again, here are the ligaments that are holding this in place. And then I've got all these other muscles that are also holding the shoulder joint in place. But it's not like most joints. It's not as well protected. And you can imagine that it would be fairly easy if you were playing some kind of uh, rigorous activity for somebody to get hit right there and for that to just completely pop out of that. What do you think that would do to all those ligaments and the muscles that surround that? It, it would tear it. It would rip, the rip them to shreds, right? And the degree to which that happened would depend on or would um, uh, be the basis for how the recovery after that went. The more severe that damage, the more um, uh, significant that that would be. What do we call the set of muscles that surround this um, this joint here? Does anybody know? Yeah, the shoulder joint. No, what what what, what am I doing with my arm here? I'm rotating, right? So this is the rotator cuff that surrounds this. The set of muscles is the rotator cuff muscles that holds that into place, and that would make it so that. Um, if you ripped your rotator cuff, you might have to have rotator cuff surgery. And that could potentially be career-ending if you're a, a pitcher. Okay. So one last thing that I did then is that I gave you a set of diagrams with some labels on that last page here. And let's look at that real quick. We've still got 10 minutes, right? I thought it was 10.50, or 11.50. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so what I'm going to expect next time, I've given you a list of diagrams, and I've given you the terms. And so we're, we'll have a question of the day related to these three diagrams. I'll give you the diagram with the letters 
and then I'll give you the list of names in mixed up order and you'll have to match the names to the terms. Okay? Now, if you previously did this in medical forensics, I'm not going to require you to take this question of the day. Okay? Because you've already done this once and then you had a bone test to uh, prove that you understood all of this. So if you were in medical forensics and you've done this, then I'm not going to ask you to do it again. Uh, and uh, I will just excuse you from that question of the day. Um, the other thing that we'll talk a lot about is range of motion here. Um, pectoral girdle and upper limb have huge range of motion due to three factors. And at some point in the course, I'll ask you to write an essay question comparing and contrasting the structure and function of the pectoral girdle versus the pelvic girdle. And these are things that you will put into your discussion. Um, we have a lot of range of motion here due to only a single attachment to the axial skeleton where the clavicle serves as a hinge. The relatively loose attachments of the scapula to the posterior chest wall and the mobility provided by the shallow glenoid cavity and surrounding ligaments and muscles, okay? This is very, very free in its range of motion. On the other hand, you'll find out that the, the, the joint that holds the femur in is a very deep cup, and the head of the femur fits deeply into it, so it's very difficult to dislocate your hip or your femur. But the shoulder is easily dislocated, sacrificing stability for huge range of motion. Okay, so keep those things in mind. Why do we have this range of motion? It's because I only have one attachment to the axis. The back part of the circle of bone is only loosely attached to the posterior wall, and I have the shallow glenoid cavity. So how does structure reflect function? Okay, any questions about your question of the day next time? be able to match these with their correct terms. So we're doing this and the other graph for question. Oh, 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 I forgot about that. Oh, there's this. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll combine this with another question of the day later on, okay? So just, just, the, uh, just the chemical, the biochemical one. Okay. Okay, not this. Okay, and be looking at your, your uh, study guide. We'll go through the study guide next time completely, and then your test on that will be the following Friday. Your test is tomorrow. Yeah.